the songs enables me to uh, take a little break periodically from other things that come into my mind since they're not quite as connected as some of the things like the doctrinal epistles. I think Sunday will be Mother's Day. I want to address the matters related to that subject. But I do plan on coming back to the Psalms. And uh, there's some other Psalms I want to look at together with you. For just a little bit of how my thinking goes. And uh, my mind was drawn to Matthew chapter 13 this week. And I know some of you are studying the Gospel of Matthew. In, uh, Bible fellowship of it. Uh, so we're going to intrude in that, and I'm only going to be doing this section uh, in Matthew this morning, not uh, anything beyond that. So you don't wonder if I'm going to get Matthew again. I just want to look at one of the parables in Matthew chapter 13. Says, As a church, we're a church built on the Word of God, built on the ministry of the Word of God. Committed to sharing the gospel with the lost so that they might hear and believe the word of God. And in Matthew 13, particularly this first parable where we're focused, uh, addresses the issues related to that. If you've been studying Matthew, or if you've studied it uh, sometime in the not too distant past, you're aware that when we come to Matthew chapter 13, we undergo a transition not only in the book, but in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we have come to the point where the nation Israel's rejection of their Messiah is accepted as final. There is no going back. In chapter 11 of Matthew, you had something of the ministry of John the Baptist come to its climax. And... John the Baptist was sent by God to be the forerunner of Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. In Matthew 11, verse 10, Jesus said, This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And Jesus goes on to say that John the Baptist was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And his ministry was to prepare the way for the Messiah. But the nation has not been open to that. And in verse 20, he began to denounce some of the cities where he had done great miracles. And yet they had not believed. They not only had the testimony of John the Baptist, but they had the testimony of the life, the teachings, and the miracles of Christ. And he tells them what lies before them is the severe, most severe of judgment. In fact, it will be greater judgment for them than it will be for the city of Sodom in the day of judgment. He notes these in verse 22 and verse 24 of chapter 11. Yet at the end of the chapter, he still offers a gracious invitation to come to him. When you come to chapter 12, some of the leaders of the nations express their criticism of Christ and His followers. And Christ reminds them of the three offices that are His. Prophet, priest, and king. And in verse 6, He says, I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. He is greater than the temple and the priestly ministry that goes on in the temple. Because He is the one appointed to as uh, the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Who will offer with the sacrifice of Himself, the one and only sacrifice that take, him, take care of the penalty of sin. You go through this chapter... And they credit the works of Christ to the activity of the devil. And he tells them they're crossing the line to a sin that cannot be forgiven. If you credit me and my works to the work of the devil. And he tells them they're speaking out of hearts that have never been transformed. Verse 34. 
Then he tells them down in verse 41, something greater than Jonah is here. The last statement in verse 41. He's the greatest prophet. Remember Moses said, the Lord in the latter days would raise up a prophet like myself. Christ was priest, his prophet. And then someone greater than Solomon is here at the end of verse 42, King. And reminds them of his offices and brought together in one person, prophet, priest, and king. Yet the chapter ends with his mother and physical mother, physical brothers so, coming to see him. And he says, who are my family members, my family members? mother, my brothers, my sisters, are those who believe in me, do my will. And turning away from the physical nation Israel that is placed under the judgment of God. So when you come to chapter 13 of Matthew, that's why it's important to study the gospel of Matthew in its entirety. You see where you've come to. The nation is now being placed under judgment. The kingdom now is not an option for them. The nation is moving to judgment. Individuals in the nation can still come to salvation. The kingdom is not an option for the nation. Truth is now going to be withheld from them rather than freely given to them. So he's going to speak to them in parables. Verse 3 of chapter 13. He spoke many things to them in parables. And this is to the large crowds in verse 2 who have gathered. And the situation is he has gotten in a boat and moved a little away from the shore. So it's easier to address the people. They don't crowd in and restrict his ability to speak out. So what do we do with speakers today? So he's addressing the multitudes. But he's addressing them in parables. Come to verse 10 to realize why he's doing this. The disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Mystery is something not revealed before by God, Something that could not be known apart from new revelation from God. I'm going to tell you more about the kingdom that we've been talking about. Material that has not been revealed before. And it's been given to you. Now note this is being addressed to his disciples, verse 10. Not to the multitude. To the multitude he speaks in parables. The disciples understand this is a new way of teaching by him. Why are you using parables? They are more difficult to understand. They are impossible to understand for the unbelieving multitudes. And it's his intention to hide truth now from the nation Israel because of their continued rejection of him. Verse 12, whoever has, more shall be given. He will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. The nation Israel had been blessed. The entire Old Testament had been given to the Jews. Jesus' ministry during his earthly ministry had been basically limited to the nation Israel. His disciples went out to call the nation to repentance and preparation for their Messiah and His Kingdom. Now it's being taken away. Therefore I speak to them in parables, while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled in their case. You will keep on hearing, you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, you will not perceive. The heart of this people has become dull with their Ears they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes. Hear with their ears. And understand with their hearts. And turn, return and I would heal them. 
serious business. To hear the truth of God and reject it. The nation heard. They had their Messiah there. They rejected what he said. They persisted in that. And there came a time when God said, Now I will close the door. The opportunity for you to respond, receive your Messiah and his kingdom is past. Now you march towards judgment. That does not mean his plan for the nation Israel is over. That before the promises and prophecies of that plan will be realized, there is terrible, relentless judgment coming to the nation. A judgment which they continue 2,000 years later to endure. And the worst is yet to come. Seven years tribulation, something like the world has never seen, where the world will be engulfed in tribulation and the nation Israel will suffer like they have never suffered. <clears throat> then we will have the Messiah welcomed by the nation and returned for his kingdom. This is the context of the parables of Matthew 13. And he's going to give them information that will help prepare them and help them to understand there's going to be time before the kingdom comes. The Old Testament talked about the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ without distinguishing as two separate events. So Peter wrote in his first epistle, remember chapter 1, the Old Testament prophets never could understand how the Messiah could come and suffer and die and also come and rule and reign. For us it's clear. He was coming twice. The first time to suffer and die, the second time to rule and reign. But it's now going to begin to be revealed with clarity. So we're going to begin with these parables in Matthew 13. We're not going to look at them all, but just for the picture. With Christ's ministry while he was on earth. Giving forth the word of God. But these parables will point, come over to verse 41 for a later parable here. They'll talk about the Son of Man. Uh, we've come to the end of the age, the previous uh, parable, the tares, the wheat, the tares are explained. And he says the harvest will be the end of the age. There will be a reaping at the end of the age. Verse 39, verse 40. And so the Son of Man, verse 41, will send forth His angels at the end of the age. So it reminds them they're not at the end of the age here. He's going to gather out of the kingdom. He's going to establish all unbelievers. They'll be thrown into the furnace of fire. Then the righteous will shine forth in the kingdom of their Father. Verse 49, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth. Take the wicked from among the righteous. Cast them into the furnace of fire. And uh, so on. So that's the picture. We're going from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. But we've got time in between. The disciples don't understand how much time. What's really involved here. Because you're aware... When you get to Acts chapter 1, after Christ has been crucified, raised from the dead, spent 40 days instructing them, they meet with Him on the Mount of Olives. And what's the first question they want to know? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They understood then now from what He's been teaching them from Old Testament Scriptures following His resurrection, the Messiah had to come and suffer and die. To pay the penalty for sin. Well, now we understand that. Yes, now can we have the kingdom? And he still doesn't say, no, that's a long ways off. He says, you don't need to know when the kingdom will be established. But I will tell you what you must do. And so that's the focus 
of the parables, giving them some perspective as what is going to be taking place before the kingdom will be established now that the nation Israel has rejected him. And from here, you go to the cross in Matthew's Gospel. So understanding something of the historical circumstance gives us uh, a better appreciation of where we are and why this is going on in the parables. The parables have two purposes. To conceal truth from those who have persisted in their unbelief, yet to reveal truth to those who are believers. And so he will explain some of the parables to the disciples. Because it's still confusing to them because this hasn't been the normal pattern that he uses. We're going to look at the parable of the sower in the first nine verses and then its interpretation down beginning with verse 18. This helps us because how do we interpret the parable? Well, we get a pattern here. Christ explains it. And when the explanation is given, he says, oh, that's pretty clear. That's clear. Um, well, be careful to take the explanation uh, while you're here uh, under the parable of the tares over in verses 36 and following. Reading uh, some material on this recently reminded me of it. You'll note when Christ explains where the wheat and the tares grow, he said the field is the world. Some of the reformers got themselves into problems because they said the field was the church. Read what Christ said. So they said unbelievers should be part of the church because the wheat and the tares grow together in the church. The wheat and the tares don't grow together in the church. The wheat and the tares grow together in the world. So sometimes we want to be careful, even as believers, that we're interpreting the parables carefully. So there are three things in the parable of the soils. And I usually don't alliterate things, but this just comes naturally. It just comes flowing out. We have the sower, we have the seed, and we have the soils. Those are the three important points in the parable. The sower, who is doing the sowing? The seed, what is the seed that is sown? And the soil. And it's pretty simple when you understand it. But for the unbelievers who heard this, what did Jesus talk about today? I don't know, it was confusing. He talked about a sower going out to sow seed in the field. And uh, there were different kinds of soils, and so he got a different kind of response. Uh, crop. I don't know what that had to do with anything uh, about him being king or uh, so on. So Christ will explain it to the disciples. Let's pick up with the parable. Verse 3, he taught the many things in parables, saying the sower went out to sow. And he sowed some seeds that sowed some seeds fell by the road. The birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they didn't have much soil. Immediately they sprang up. They had no depth of soil. When the sun had risen, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns. The thorns came up and choked them out. Others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Who has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, if you stop and think and put yourself in the context of that crowd, and even the disciples are a little confused, and that's why they ask the question first thing, why are you speaking to them in parables? Because if you just had that without any prior, you'd say, what was Christ talking about here? Um, so we'll start with the sower, because that's where you start. A sower went out to sow. Now, he doesn't identify the sower specifically in this parable, but later, down in chapter 13, look at verse 37. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. 
Well, take it, that is the picture of the sower. He's not mixing things here that would make it uh, confusing in the wrong sense. So he starts with his ministry. That's why I say, you see, this, these parables help us to understand what will go on from the time of Christ's ministry and rejection, sowing the seed, till the time when he returns to establish his kingdom. This is new information now about material, uh, what will take place during this time. So Christ is the sower. Now, as we're going to move down toward the, the second coming of Christ, and this is involving that period of time, uh, we know that it will include his followers. So he begins with himself, but the ministry that he had in sowing seed, giving out the truth of the gospel and the truth concerning himself will continue. In Math and John's Gospel, chapter 20. Turn to God's Gospel, chapter 20. I'll put a quote in for you, but you know, put it in. Jesus has been raised from the dead. In meeting with his disciples. And when they see him and uh, you know, they all rejoice. But look at verse 21. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. Now note, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Then he breathes on them. Tell them to receive the Holy Spirit, which will not happen uh, for a short time yet. Um, we're within uh, a short time, less than two weeks, we say. And that will be their ministry to go out and announce forgiveness of sins, how your sins could be forgiven. But you'll notice know, the same ministry he had. The ministry that God gave him when he came to earth to announce the truth concerning himself now is passed on to his disciples, and you're sent out to carry on that ministry. So if you turn over a few pages, I say we were within a short time, less than two weeks, because when you come to Acts chapter 1, we're about 10 days away from Acts chapter 2 with the coming of the Spirit. And they ask, will you restore the kingdom? Uh, verse 6. He had told them they were going to receive the Holy Spirit in verse 5 in many days. They thought maybe that's connected with him establishing the kingdom. That's what he says in verse 7. You don't need to know the times and when. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Remember back in John chapter 20, he said, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That anticipated what was going to happen. Remind you, there's going to be a time period here when He won't be on earth. But His presence on earth will be taken by the Holy Spirit ministering through His followers. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, the disciples don't grasp it yet, but this is indicating we're going to have some time going here. You know, during Christ's earthly ministry, it was basically limited to Israel. It was rare that he went outside the boundaries of the land of Israel. Remember, he told the, the Canaanite woman, I'm not sent to the lost outside of Israel. I'm only sent to the house of Israel. But now, you are going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, beyond Jewish areas. You're going out to uttermost parts of the earth. Now, they don't understand. We're talking... Here we are, 2,000 years later. Gospel still going out. But they will be the witnesses. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. You don't need to turn there. But Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ. 
as though God were beseeching you through us to be reconciled to God. Carrying on that ministry. It's the ministry that you and I have when we share the gospel. When we believe the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. So He can be the enabling power and we give forth the Word. And so we come to the second main thing. Come back to Matthew chapter 13. We have the sower who is Christ and from what we know as Scripture unfolds, the followers of Christ right down to today. How do people get saved? Someone shares the truth with him. The seed. Well, he says in verse 19, as he explains, Matthew 13, 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, that's the seed that's sown. The word of the kingdom. Or as Luke chapter 8, verse 11 says, in interpreting this parable, the word of God. The truth about the kingdom. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3, what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again, or you will never see the kingdom of God. You'll never be part of it. The message of salvation in Christ. How do you be part of the kingdom? On Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapter 14, he encouraged the disciples, through many tribulations we will enter the kingdom. And that future kingdom. All believers are going to be part of it. Israel will be the nation that is the focus in the kingdom. But all believers will be in the kingdom. We, the church, will rule and reign with Christ in the kingdom. So, uh, the seed is the word of God. The truth. The message of Christ. There's power in it. Come over to Mark chapter 4. In a parable given after this one, Mark records uh, what Christ says about seed. Verse 26. He was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. Now note here. He goes to bed at night, gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he himself does not know how. The soil produces crops by itself. The blade, the head, the mature grain. Then, the right, right time to have the harvest. It's showing there is power. There is life in the seed itself. The Lord will go out, so is the seed. But the life that will germinate and produce the plant is in the seed. Um, the farmer went in, takes a nap, you know, the watering comes, the sunshine. Basically, he doesn't go back in and do something to the seed to make it come to life. There's life in the seed. That's the point. It's important to grasp it here. The sower sows seed, but the life and the power, if you will, is in the seed. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. You know that. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. The power is in the truth that is presented. That's the seed. And it's effective when a person believes. We'll see that in a moment. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, The Word of God is alive and active, more powerful than a two-edged sword. It pierces down into the innermost recesses, dividing asunder the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's amazing. Um, the Word of God's alive. It's active. And it gets down into the most innermost recesses to do a work that only the Word of God can do. 
James chapter 1, verse 21 says, Receive the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. And talk about that reception of it, so it's just not laying there. And uh, come to first, come on, turn over to first Peter. We've been studying first Peter. Some here on Sunday night, the Bible might be worn there. All the way almost to the book of Revelation at the back, just some forward a couple pages. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 23. You have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. You see, that word of God is living. It is enduring. It is the seed that brings birth. And it stays alive. The word of God is just as alive today as it was 2,000 years ago. That's amazing. The word has not changed. It's still alive. You take this gospel, this truth, and you share it, and a person hears it and it penetrates into the innermost recesses of their soul, and they respond in faith and they're saved. You're here as a testimony to that. If you've heard the, the gospel, you believe that you were saved. It does the same thing. It's just as alive today. You think about it. You have in your hands. You've committed the memory in your mind. That which is the very power of God. Oh, if I only had more power. If I only could do more. You have it all. The Word of God is alive and active. But it doesn't go anywhere if I take it home and put it on the shelf. Pick it up next week. It has to be so. So that's where we're going. Come back to Matthew 13. We have the sower beginning with Christ and those who will follow in His footsteps, if you will. The seed, they will do, be doing what Christ did. Giving out the Word of God. Sowing the seed. The focus in this parable is on the soils. The soils represent the hearts. And it all depends on what kind of heart the seed falls on. Now, if you don't sow the seed, those who sow a counterfeit, that's what the wheat and tares parable does, you know. When you sow tares, you get tares. So there are many religious groups, sometimes called Christian, because Christian includes all branches of Protestantism and Catholicism and a lot of uh, strange connections. But if they're sowing tares, they get tares. So we're operating on the basis here as Christ and this is His followers. They will sow His truth. They know where the devil's going to work. Turns the church and believers away from the truth of God. Because whatever else they do, if they're not involved in the Word of God and its purity and sowing that Word, Nothing's going to happen. Because your good works, my good works, are not where the power is. The power in life is in the seed. So we have churches getting involved in all kinds of good things, quote, good works, helping to improve the community and feed the hungry and clothe the poor, in and of themselves, are they bad? No. Will they bring life to the dead? No. Charles Spurgeon, uh, many years ago, said, if you think you can create a new heart, you should start by creating a fly. Because that will reveal something to you. You can't even create a fly. It's impossible that you or I could create a new heart. God in His plan is you give forth my truth, which is my power for salvation. I shouldn't be confused what the devil's plan is. 
So the seed is sown by the sower, starting with Christ. And the first kind of heart it falls on, verse 5, verse 4. Some fell beside the road. The birds came and ate them up. Come down to verse 19 for the interpretation. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one who was sown, uh, on whom the seed was sown by the road. Um, we have it today, but not the same way. But in those days, you sowed seed by hand. So you had paths through the field. Because you can only get the seed going so far. Uh, so you walk the path and you throw the seed. Now you want the seed to come as close to the path as can be because you want as much crop as possible. <coughs> Nowadays, you know, we have modern things to get it out there, but we want to get as big a harvest as possible. But some of that seed would naturally fall on the path that has be been beaten rock hard from because that's how you cut through the fields. Remember, people walked in those days. We read about the disciples walking through fields. Well, you, have, you can't look at our fields today and get that picture. The fields, that was the path you went through. Some of the seed falls on that rock hard path. It goes nowhere. It lays there. The birds come down and eat the seed. Take it away. That picture is the devil coming and snatching the seed away. Turn over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Very important that we grasp these things. Verse 11. I referred to this earlier. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The word of the kingdom. It's the same thing. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. So that they will not believe and be saved. See what happens. It is a serious matter. When a person hears the word of God, but their heart is hard, they've steeled themselves. And so the word of God just lies on that heart. You think the devil just leaves it there? Maybe sometime something will happen and the devil's quick to remove it. A serious thing to not respond to the word of God. Have a heart that's so close to it. Uh, that's the situation. Uh, in a different picture, come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Different uh, comparison, but the same point. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 3. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In which case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ who is the image of God. Same uh, point, but a different metaphor, different picture. But uh, people hearing the word of God but not responding to it. The devil is there. You understand what's going on in this auditorium right now? The devil's demons are at work. Those people are hearing the word of God and um, fighting against the ministry of the Spirit of God. They're trying to distract people's minds and attention. And any unbelievers, so that they'll be occupied with other things and thinking how oh, it's offensive and telling me that I have to do this and this is the only way and that and quickly turn them away so that the truth that has been presented can be removed. Every time you present the gospel to someone, that same battle is going on. If the devil is just laying back, waiting to see if anything, he's out there. We forget we're in a spiritual war. Let's come back to Matthew 13. That's the hard heart. You know, the responsibility here is on the heart to respond. That hard heart 
There's no blame on the sower. We start out with Christ. You're not going to say it was the sower's fault for not doing something. There's no problem with the seed. We start with Christ sowing the seed. The problem's with the heart. Been hardened against truth. Now there's a second kind of heart. Look at verse 5 of Matthew 13. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. Immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. Uh, this is common in Palestine, the rocky land. You have that like a shelf of limestone rock. Then you have a thin layer of soil over it. Um, well, obviously, with the soil was that shallow, the seed's thrown down, it doesn't go down far. There's no real depth to the roots. But it springs up, looks great. As soon as the scorching heat comes out there, that plant withers because there's no root to sustain it. Uh, this is the person who has an immediate response to the word. That is superficial. It may be just emotional. I'm not saying that in a genuine response, there may not be much emotion. There may. I mean, we're emotional beings. When you're being cleansed from sin, made new. Okay? Good reason to be emotional. But if that's all there is, there's no depth. And we can't tell. You know, there's nothing said here that the sower should have known this was a hard heart. The sower should have known it was this kind of heart. The sower should do what the sower's responsibility is. And so the seed that God has given. And we look and say, wow, this is exciting. And we encourage a person who responds. We present the gospel and oh, this is what I've been looking for. Thank you, Lord. Uh, my sins are lifted. I feel like a new person. And, and we're excited with them. And we should be. Because we don't know what's going on in our heart. Only God does. But time will tell. This doesn't mean, well, then we'll have to wait till time passes. No, when we get to Acts chapter 2, what do they do? 3,000 people respond to Peter's sermon saying they believe, they want to believe in Christ, and they get baptized right away. Now later in Acts chapter 8, they'll baptize Simon the magician, and uh, we, Peter will later say, I think you're still in the bond of iniquity. You've never been saved. We can't tell. So I can't tell here. But time will tell. Uh, will they endure? Uh, look at, back up to chapter 11 of Matthew. Look at verse 6. Christ said, Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Or, as you have in the margin of your Bible, stumble over me. When you come back to Matthew chapter 13, you'll note verse 21. When persecution arises, right at the end of verse 21, immediately he falls away. You know, we have the same verb, cause to stumble. When pressure and opposition and difficulty come, this person stumbles over Christ. This is not what I signed up for. I can't take the loss of my family. I can't take the rejection here. I can't take being treated this way by former friends of that. And he's caused to stumble. He takes offense at Christ. It would have come to him. would have talked to him. Uh, and he abandons the faith. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. This is a serious issue that New Testament writers are concerned about repeatedly. Hebrews chapter 10, Peter's right, uh, Peter. the writer to Hebrews is writing to Jewish believers who are in danger because of the relentlessness of their suffering. They've gone through periods and they suffered loss greatly. Some lost their homes, their possessions. Some were in prison. And now another cycle of persecution is coming around. It's like I can't do this again. This is written in chapter 10 to encourage them. He tells them in verse 32, Remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of suffering. 
You were made a public spectacle, reproaches, tribulations. Uh, you lost your property. It goes down to verse 34. Verse 35, don't throw away your confidence which have great reward. You have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For in, yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Reminder, you know, it's getting to be a time now. I mean, the disciples were asking in Acts chapter 1, will you restore the kingdom at this time? But now, you know, we go through weeks, months, years of trial and difficulty and suffering. I don't know that I can keep doing this. He said, you don't give up. Uh, he is coming again. That's when it will all be taken care of. But note when he goes on with the quotes from the Old Testament. My righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith in the preserving of the soul. The righteous shall live by faith, taken from the back. And we quote that, and that's how a person is saved. But you know, saving faith is enduring faith, as we've talked about. That begins a life that is a life of faith. Not an easy life. A life of trial and difficulty. Christ stressed this during his earthly ministry. Count the cost before you commit to be my disciple. You can't be my disciple if you love your family more than me. You can't be my disciple if you're not willing to give up all your own possessions. Even your own life. You have to take up your cross and follow me. We're all talking about the same thing. Christ knew those would go against him. In John chapter 6, we won't turn there, verse 66, we are told as a result of what Christ was teaching, many of his disciples turned back and didn't follow him anymore. Uh, they became offended with him. They stumbled over him. Now, I want to be careful. I can't always tell whether this stumble um, you know, Peter stumbled. He denied the Lord three times. Let us run and rush in there and say, oh, well, obviously Peter was not genuine. Uh, as James wrote in James chapter 3, we all stumble in many ways. Um, but we can't turn away. And sometimes we can't tell. There are people who seem to stumble and turn away, and then they recover. And then they stumble again and turn away, and I can't see the heart. Sometimes we have to talk to a person, are you sure that you have a settled relationship with the Lord? Do you really trust in Him? Um, but the failure to persevere, I've shared with you, we had a person who taught here for several years in our adult Sunday school. I told, told you, I have still had the syllabus he prepared on the doctrine of salvation. One day he walked in my office, laid on the desk like this, and said, I don't believe any of it. I just learned it. That was 35, 40 years ago. To this day, he lives as a committed unbeliever, not open to hear truth. I can't tell, I couldn't tell. He'd come and talk to me about the theology he was reading and what he was going to include in what he was teaching on the doctrine of salvation. And we'd interact about it. He'd put together his lesson. Then he comes and I don't believe any of it. I can tell. I don't know. So there are shallow heart hearers. You don't know. We welcome them as believers. But even if they get baptized, like signs of magicians, doesn't mean they really are. And the writer to Hebrews is concerned. You've endured great. But those who endure to the end of the ones who manifest their genuine. Come back to Matthew 13. There's a cluttered heart. And this is a weedy heart. Uh, verse 7. Some seed fell among the thorns, and thorns came and choked them out. Call it the cluttered heart because, as Christ interprets it down in verse 22, the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word, 
The worry of the world, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the world, and it becomes unfruitful. Matthew, Mark 4.19 says the desires for other things. Luke chapter 8, uh, verse 14 says the pleasures of this life. Prosperity has its own dangers. And part of it is a test to test our genuineness. Back up to Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Christ addressed this early. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, or steal. No, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You've got your eyes fixed on the things of this world and this life. You have a dark soul. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. Doesn't mean you can't have wealth. But you know, it becomes a very real temptation once we have it. Not to have it get a hold of us. It becomes our treasure. No longer am I living for what God has promised me in Christ. The inheritance I have in heaven. I have to be careful. I've worked hard to get what I have. Uh, we have our home. I have my savings. I have a good job. I have a good reputation. I have. And those things squeeze in. And you know, it's difficult. Prosperity is its own threat. We don't have time to go back, but in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and again in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God warned Israel, as they prepared to go into the land He promised, when you go into that land, and I give you prosperity, health and things to enjoy, you better be careful you don't forget who gave them to you. But Israel did forget. It was hard today. One thing I was taught early when I was doing some studies that one of the greatest threats to healthy Christianity is prosperity. Um, studies done show that when Christianity moves into a new part of the world, it makes its impact among the poor, but then they become more uh, conscientious, more responsible, harder workers more reliable, trustworthy, and they begin to rise in the social period. But the intensity and fire of the Christianity begins to decline. It's hard. We're prosperous. It's just hard to be absorbed with what Christ says we have to absorb. Be absorbed. If you know, I have so much to enjoy, so little time to do it. That's why we get happier if we can squeeze church into a little less time because I have so much to do. Three hours for a football game is nothing, but an hour for a Bible study, you don't understand. My kids have this, my kids have that, we have this, we have prosperity. It's a challenge. I'm not saying anything wrong with prosperity. There's parts of Scripture that say God has given us every good thing to enjoy. And we can enjoy things with our wives while we have good health. I believe those parts. I'm trying to enjoy them, to do them. But I must not forget where my treasure is, there my heart will be. Though I hold these things lightly, they're not what my life is about. I'm not saying I don't enjoy them. I don't want to say I wish I was, you know, scrounging for enough food to get by today or, uh, you know, enough to pay the rent for one more week or something like that. No. God has blessed us with many blessings. But I want to be aware of the danger that those blessings become a trap. They absorb me. John Wesley put it, whenever I get any extra money, I give it away, lest it find its way into my heart. And that's the danger. The blessings we have, these materials, don't find their way into our heart. And pretty soon I find my life 
built and arranged around them. Now things are out of perspective. No man can serve two masters. So if I think I've got it worked out, I don't have it worked out. Because I can't serve. Because he demands everything. He hasn't asked me to give away everything. But if we do so tomorrow, are we ready to do it? And live for him. All right. One more heart. We have to get to the good one. Do you understand? We have four kinds of hearts. Three of them are hearts of those who are unbelievers. Never would genuinely be saved. They're chasing after the things of the world. Ultimately realize they never had a heart for the Lord. But the heart back in Matthew chapter over in Matthew chapter 13. Some ground, some seed fell on good soil. Verse 8. You were a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. And verse 23, on the one on whom seed was sown on good soil, this is the man who hears the word, understands it, bears fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now again, we don't necessarily compare ourselves with each other. You know, I mentioned, quoted Spurgeon earlier. I read Spurgeon, I am blessed and I am discouraged. How did he do this? He's been dead since 1892, and I'm still reading stuff he writes and blessed by it. And I'm reading he spoke, preached ten times that week. And I'm thinking, you sluggard. You're not doing anything. And then he's got this and this and this and this, and he's producing, I have 63 volumes of Spurgeon sermons. And that's not all they produced. I say, Lord, how could I do so little? And he didn't even have a typewriter, let alone a computer. I mean, me? I can't compare myself to someone else. Uh, I can be challenged. But you'll know, even good ground produces some 100 fold, some 60, some 30. So what I have to do is produce the best I can. And, uh, but we all should be producing if we have hearts that have beliefs. So every heart produces. And again, I can't tell. Well, where do you get to the line? Because we're only producing 30, and I'm looking at somebody producing 100. I say, well, maybe. And you know, we could have gone back Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount again. You know a tree by its fruit. Every tree produces good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Galatians 5, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and you know, I can't see the heart. We can see the result. We look around at each other, we have a good idea. People have demonstrated, you know, claimed their faith in Christ, seemed clear on the doctrine, they have lives that over time have manifested it. But that doesn't mean we don't accept anybody here who hasn't demonstrated they've been a consistent believer for 10 years and profess their faith and say, I'm ready to be baptized and there's a baptism tonight, I'm in. Would we turn them away? No. Well, how could you know for sure he was saved? I will know for sure next week. Or maybe next month, the back only God sees the heart. He may stumble, but he may recover. But he may stumble because it's a fall from which he won't recover. kind of heart. You know, we want to have the right kind of pressure and not take upon ourselves the wrong kind. If I take it as my responsibility to see the Word working in your heart, I'm in a bad spot because I can't do it. I can't change your heart. I can't make a difference. Uh, you can. If you say, well, I shared the Gospel and uh, nobody believed it, therefore, Maybe I shouldn't be sharing the gospel. Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the message of Christ. Romans chapter 10. The only way people get saved, they have to be exposed to the truth. And that's what Romans 10 is saying. That's what we do. We carry on the work of Christ. Most of the people rejected him. At least three quarters of the hearts are going to be negative. And that's just in the picture we can expect. 
the gate is narrow, the way is narrow, we don't expect large response. Sometimes, in periods of time, by God's grace and His plan, there may be large numbers saved and responsive. Other times it may seem barren. It may seem every soul, every heart is concrete hardness. What am I going to tell God? I quit sowing because the hearts weren't good. Well, I didn't tell you to check the hearts, did I? I told you, go sow the seed. So, uh, I remember a conversation with a fellow pastor a few years ago. He said, I'm not taking responsibility for the condition of the people that I preached to. Now, his prayer and desire was for their change, but he can't change them. <coughs> I can't take responsibility with the condition of your heart and your response to the truth. But I will be held accountable if I taught you the truth faithfully. You can't change the hearts of your kids, your grandkids, your parents, your friends, but they can't be saved if they don't have the seed of God's Word somewhere in that heart. Let's read that. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, we are in awe as we are reminded by the Word that the Word that, that has saved us and made us new by the power of the Spirit is the same Word which is your power for the salvation of the most hopeless of sinners. Lord, how blessed we are to have been called to salvation in Christ, entrusted with that which is your power for salvation to everyone who hears and believes. May we be those who are faithfully sowing the seed of your truth wherever we go. Lord, you know the hearts of each one gathered here. They are open and naked before your eyes. Pray the Spirit will do the work of the heart that only he can do with your word. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.